Uh, so my name is Terry Bristol, President of the Institute for Science, Engineering, Public Policy. This is the 2014-2015 Linus Pauli Memorial Lectures. So it's the institute that uh, organizes the lecture series, but only with our, uh, our wonderful co-sponsors, and the main one being Mentor Graphics Corporation. And uh, thank you to them. Yes, absolutely. Um, also, Oregon Episcopal School, FEI company. Anybody here from FEI? Yes? Because apparently somebody called me from FEI today and he says, is this uh, Life Ascendant? And I go like, no, that was like a year ago. That was last, I did give that talk last May. So apparently whoever was sending out the flyer to the people at FEI sent them out the flyer for the talk from last year. But anyway, so. But it's just, it's just I talked to whoever I talked to on the phone, maybe it was like, this is an extension of that, so you won't be disappointed, hopefully. So FEI, Rockwell Collins, uh, Portland State University, Onami, uh, Portland Community College, uh, Clark College, Vancouver, Clackamas Community College, and Albina Community Bank. And then, very important is uh, Mentor Graphics Foundation gives us tickets for the uh, K-12, K-14 students and teachers. Okay, so there we go. Thank you to all of them. Now, I would say, so here's like the title of my talk. I'm going to introduce myself more in a minute, but, and uh, so someone said to me, it's like, it's pretentious. You're like, you're not an engineer. How can you talk about engineering? It's like, well, so I hope I'm going to, so yeah, I thought, well, a better title would have been The Moral uh, Agenda of Engineering or something like that. Anyway, so, but you'll see. I think it's actually a legit, and, and actually I am an engineer, and, so the secondary topic here besides what is engineering is what is the value context of engineering? <clears throat> you thought engineering was just applied science. Well, <clears throat> maybe not. Okay, so uh, I can do this now. How am I doing this? I do. So this is a little background on me. Uh, I started as a in philosophy of science, and then I gradually realized that that the the scientific view of science didn't really make sense. You know, like everything's determined and why are we asking questions in the first place? And, and there were a lot of different problems that came up with the, uh, with the scientific view of science. And so then I've morphed into engineering, which I'll explain a little bit tonight. Uh, so I did Berkeley undergrad and then University of London. These are kind of my mentors uh, that I was involved with. Okay, so it's always good to tell you where I'm going. So um, we know that engineering, as we're thinking about mostly, and I'm going to broaden the idea of engineering, but the engineering is dealing with practical uh, problem solving. And arguably, by its very nature, as practical problem solving, uh, it's dedicated to bringing, back, bringing about or bringing forth a more desirable future. There's problem solving is going from a current state of affairs to a future more desirable state of affairs. So it's involved with values. All right. So the value cut, and then the more, more radical uh, conclusion that I'm going to go to is the, if we, as we probe into what, what is the value context of engineering, what, are, what is a better world, and I'm actually argue that it's, that it's the moral context. And um, I'm just going to mention real quick here, there's, a, there's another book out of somebody trying to do this guy named uh, Michael Shermer, who runs Skeptic Magazine and so forth, and he has a book called The Moral Arc in which he's sort of arguing the same thing as I'm going to argue tonight, although he sort of says technology and moral development, you know, history of, the history of uh, technological development in Western civilization, the history of moral development are actually, uh, you know, covariant. They go together. And uh, I don't think he does a very good job of making that point, but I think that's, he gives, you know, it's a good shot. Uh, okay, so organizationally, I'm going to go after, I'm going to come back to, I'm going to go back and forth and come back to two questions. One is, what is the relation between science and engineering? And the other question is, what is the relation of engineering or engineering slash science to the humanities? All right? So keep your, keep your hat on, and that's kind of where I'm going to be going. So, <clears throat> oops, I didn't, I'm going to stay with this for a minute. Okay, so how do we, I'm going to give you a little background on this question. So one, every time when I organize a series, I always go ask the various people, say, hey, who would you like to see, and so forth. And I was having this conversation with Nancy Lapotin, who's kind of the science curriculum person at uh, Portland Public Schools, and we're talking about STEM, okay? You know, if you know STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, this is the new, the new curriculum, you know, be all and end all. And so I'm going like, oh yeah, STEM, that's going to be interesting. And what's the E about, 
okay? Well, you know, we've had science, as you can read, biology and chemistry and physics and so forth, and we, and we have mathematics, we have algebra, calculus, and so we sort of know what those, those have been like standard things, okay? So we know what those are, and we threw technology in, you know, like Intel started saying technology, science and technology fairs, so technology is sort of there, but we're not real sure what it is, we're mostly talking about technology, and then there's the E. I said, so what do you think E is, Nancy? And she goes, like, problem solving. I go, bingo. What kind of problem solving? Practical problem solving, real world problem solving. So how is a teacher going to be teaching about, teaching about engineering in the STEM curriculum is going to be a very different shift from talking about, uh, you know, science. Science is like discovering the facts, you know, whatever. No moral thing. Engineering has a value component to it, and this is going to be, that's kind of what I'm talking about today. So, so she sort of challenged me to say, you know, well, what are we going to do there? Now, give me another background thing for me. So I did my undergraduate at Berkeley. When I went to Berkeley, it was actually the second year, maybe, yeah, second year, I ended up rooming with or sharing a house with a couple of guys who were engineers. And it struck me at that time that I had never actually th even thought about, considered, had present presented to me the idea of majoring in engineering. I went down there to do astronomy, you know. So... So I was asking, say, where, how did you ever, th who, who encouraged you to go into engineering? And they all had kind of little stories. Their father was an engineer or something. But I had never been exposed to engineering at all in Portland Public Schools. And uh, I had no idea what engineering was. I, mean, I kind of knew what it was from background. But it was never something that you would go major in. Now, the other thing that was very striking uh, that I learned from these guys in GC is that the College of Engineering was separate from the rest of the university. Okay? So that's clever. So the engineers, for instance, uh, didn't take the regular English course. You know, we had to learn how to write and all that sort of stuff. They had their own special courses. And the, and the argument was, well, they don't, it's not fair to let the, have the engineers compete with the English majors. Like, you know, well, they had dummy science, too. So we had a dummy science course for the, for the English majors who, you know, didn't want to compete in the real science courses with, uh, with the engineers and the scientists. So there's this separation... And it's still the case. Uh, I just went back to a conference uh, I'll talk about a little later uh, with a lot of engineering provosts, deans, and everything, a whole bunch of colleges back in Washington, D.C. And they're all, almost, I mean, I think all of them, with the possible exception of Purdue University, all the engineering curriculum is separate from the uh, liberal arts curriculum. So why is that? How did that happen? So... I'm going to give you one idea of how, one, one of the stories that is very common. So after World War II, there was this realization that science and engineering had been extremely important in winning the war, and also that there was an economic benefit to science and engineering. So Truman asked this guy, Vannevar Bush, who was the, uh, he was actually in charge of all the financing of all the science and engineering during World War II. And he said, Vannevar Bush, what is it, you know, we need to create this, you know, we need to do public investment and in, in research, and National Science Foundation, and so forth. How are we going to do this? What is it? And what is, what's the difference between science and engineering? So Bush writes, writes this book called Science, the Endless Frontier. And, uh, and, and to, be, to be fair to him, he, he does say in it, he says, I don't really know what the relationship is between them. There's some ambiguity there. But in the end, he says, well, science is research, and engineering is application. So we'll do it that way. And this, this has stuck institutionally for a long time. Now, any of you, I suppose, I assume a lot of you have watched at least something of the Big Bang Theory on, on this program on, on uh, television. And you notice in the Big Bang Theory, Howard is the engineer, and Howard is always put down by Sheldon and, you know, Leonard is, they're the scientists, you know, yeah, well, I have a PhD, and uh, you know, Leonard is, or uh, uh, Howard, well, I have a master's degree from, so engineers often don't have PhDs, at least typically, they're starting to get them now, but the engineer was always down, and when somebody told me, well, was, oh, they said, oh, yeah, I said, at MIT, if you have a three-story building, the science department has the top floor, the mathematics people have the second floor, and the engineers are always on the bottom floor. So there's this ranking that, you know, the like engineers are sort of like, they don't really rank and they're, and they're just considered like, you know, people that apply things. Uh, so. Oh, and the last, another consequence, well, one consequence, so is it, when engineers, uh, engineers, as, a, as we say, were scientized. So there was, there is an engineering tradition that was independent of this and it goes way back and 
forward. It was still around in some places. But what happened after World War II is that engineering education, they did, you know, engineers didn't, a lot of them didn't get college degrees. So now we're going to have college degrees for engineers. Well, who's going to teach them? Well, they're applied scientists, so let's have the scientists teach them. So, and the word we use is that the, the engineers got scientized. Okay? So they, got, they were told, they were given the science framework. This is what, you know, this is what the universe is about. It's all, you know, science is the universe. And we're going to teach you guys some stuff. And, and as uh, Steve Weinberg said, isn't it quaint that the engineers think that they can actually uh, uh, change the course of events in the world because we scientists know that it's all determined by these, you know, universal laws. And that's, what, that's the way they, they were taught. And so as a concept, one consequence of that, let's say we get together and we have a project that we're gonna, we want to build a bridge across, across the Willamette. So you get the bankers and the government people and the, some corporations and, and maybe some art people in the community and community interest groups together. We'll all get sit around and talk about what this, and the engineers are too, and talk about this, engin about this project, how are we going to design this project. Well, what happens, the first people to exit the room are the engineers. And they go like, you guys, I don't, you can't talk about that. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Uh, you know, so, the engineer, so they go out and they say, look, when you guys figure out what you want, you know, give us the specs and we'll calculate it out for you. Okay? And this, this just give me the specs attitude is, is there. And actually, I, I thought this was like getting, we were getting over this. And I just talked to somebody who's the head of the Society for philosophy of technology or something, teaches a course down at Santa Clara University, has a course for engineers. And she says, oh yeah, that's how all my engineers think. And I go like, oh no. So anyway, so the engineers have been put in this value-free thing. Now, you know, we, had a, we had a speaker in this series a few years ago, uh, William Wolf, who was the president of the National Academy of Engineering. He gives a nice talk. And at the end of the talk, he's a little Q&A. And, a. and so, so this woman stands up and she says, well, like, what, what, did, what is engineering? You know, what do, what do engineers do? She's like, no scientists. I mean, the scientists are after discovery. You know, they want to discover how the world works. What, what is engineering about? What do engineers do? And Wolf says, whatever they pay us to do. And I go like, oh. <laughs> I said, Bill, I don't think that was a well thought through answer, which you don't think it was. But, you know, this, it reflected something that was very real. And that is the engineers tend to think of themselves as you know, that, that their values, the value context of engineering comes from outside. It's, you know, as you say, exogenous, is external to the engineering profession. You know, the, the CEOs of the businesses or whatever tell me what I'm supposed to do. Uh, engineering, the idea that engineering has a self-concept, a self-agenda, is something that was, you know, uh, the engineers were told that was not the case. Okay, so not everybody, so I'm my next sort of slide here. Not everybody bought into this scientization. And so I'm going to talk about the rebels. And uh, I, I, I aligned with the rebels. So uh, one group of rebels uh, put out a, a book in, uh, it was published by the National Academy of Engineering called Engineering as a Social Enterprise. And these three guys, Walter Vincenti, Ed Wink, and Rustam Roy, there were a couple other guys in there. Ed Wink and Rustam Roy were both on our board, the Institute's board for a while. Ed was up at the University of Washington. Uh, uh, Rustin was at uh, Penn State, I think. But we spread out and they got on our board. They're, they're big players. So, and essentially what they're saying is, I'm going to read you a little thing. So engineering is not often thought of as a social enterprise, uh, but in fact social needs and pressures shape what engineers do as much as engineering and technology shape the nature of society. Okay, so that's kind of their, it goes on and on. So they're, they're saying that they agenda of society and the agenda of engineering are, are, are inseparable. So again, that's a way of pointing at the value context of engineering. Okay, this is one of my favorite guys, uh, a guy named Walter Vincenti. And uh, Walter was, uh, Walter wrote this, but he's an aeronautical engineering professor down at Stanford. And he wrote this book called What Engineers Know and How They Know It. And it's still, even today, a brilliant book. And it challenged, uh, the basic uh, theory of knowledge was scientific theory of knowledge, which if you a lot of if you go into philosophy and, and, and epistemology theory of knowledge, you get a lot of this scientific deal. And I that's what I got. I mean, it was, I was bombarded uh, throughout both my science and my philosophy education with this idea that you know knowledge was real knowledge was scientific knowledge, okay, objective scientific knowledge. So Vincenti says here. Uh, uh, Engineers are seen as uh, taking their knowledge uh, sort of downstream from scientists and by some 
occasionally dramatic and probably intellectually uninteresting process, using this knowledge to fashion material artifacts or to come up with something dramatically interesting. And then he says, and he says, engineers know from experience that this is not true. And then later on, Vincetti talks about, he's, a, he's an aeronautical engineer, so as he writes the book, he says, I'm going to stay in the area that I know, which is aeronautical engineering. And he talks about some World War II stuff and a, a, an RF, RAF guy that were making air, during, airplanes during World War II. And the guy says, you know, uh, science is good. Science is valuable. It's a good tool. It's a hammer, nails. But science doesn't tell you how to build an airplane. Okay. Science doesn't tell you how to build an iPhone. Science doesn't tell you how to do anything practical, creative in the world. Okay? So what Vincent is saying is that real knowledge is actually the practical knowledge. And science, you might say that science is... Uh, uh, feeds engineering, engineering. So in a way, science is engineering research. Okay? And in fact, another way to put it is uh, 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 what we've called scientific research is really applied engineering. Okay? The telescope, the microscope, all these things, all these great scientific discoveries came from uh, these engineering advances. There's a big debate in, when I was going through grad school in the history of science, because the history of science guys were all down the line, you know, the science is everything. And then people started pointing out, you know, well, how much of, there was this link, this tie between making engineering advances and then making scientific advances. I mean, Galileo, so wonderful. Well, how I was the one who found the telescope. Well, who built the telescope? The telescope is an engineering enterprise, okay? It's not a science. It's not science. But he got all the science coming from this invention. And he started thinking back, there's a bunch of them like that. And it got down to the point where we were kind of going rule of thirds. About a third of the time, you could clearly say that the engineering was coming first and the science later. About a third of the time, you could make an argument that the science stimulated the engineering. And about a third of the time, they're so messy, you couldn't figure it out. Now, recently, um, my friend Henry Petrosky at Duke has put out a book called, which I highly recommend, called The, the Essential Engineer, in which Petrosky says, actually, it's all engineering. Everything that you thought was science is actually engineering. Okay? And, and people who have science degrees or out in the workplace know that most of what they do is actually engineering and not science. Okay, so, bye-bye. So the third, uh, the third rebel I talk about is this guy, is Herb Simon. Uh, Simon got the Nobel Prize in economics. I wrote a great book called Sciences of the Artificial, which I call one of the primary early books of, you know, philosophy of engineering, this engineering worldview. And uh, he did two things. When he said, what is engineering? Is, first thing is engineering is problem solving. And the problem of engineering is, is you see this textbook, the problem of science is discovery, the problem of engineering is design. What's that mean? Okay. So first thing he says is engineering problem solving is attempting to move from a current state to a future more desirable state. Okay? Pretty straightforward. From the problem, problematic state to the solution state is to, a, you know, it's almost a tautology. Okay, so we're really, so what engineers are trying to do, engineering practical problem solving is trying to move from a current situation to a better situation. Straightforward. There's values involved in that already, okay? So we see a link here to the, to the, uh, humanities, the relationship between engineering and humanities. All right, so. So one thing to say also here, there's a debate in this, gr in this group that I hang out with and, and talk about this stuff. Uh, a guy named Steve Goldman, who was in the lecture series too, and Steve got into talking about engineering very early on before some of this stuff, and he got a grant to talk about engineering. So they said, what do engineers do? How do they do it? So Steve's grant was all about people who have engineer in their degree as an engineering or they have engineering in their title. So there's a debate. In who is, what, when we're talking about engineering, who are we talking about? Are we talking about those, the people who are the, uh, you know, have those titles and stuff like that, or are we talking about somebody else? And one of the things I learned is a lot of the people with engineering titles and their Jobs are not doing engineering, <laughs> they're doing other things. So what happened here was, so what I want to do here is kind of go along the lines of these rebels and, and I want to say, you know, what, what is engineering? What is the problem of design? So look at it this way. So how should we design the irrigation of our fields? Uh, how should we design our houses? How should we design our neighborhoods? Uh, how should we design our cities? How should we design our transportation systems? How should we design our communication systems? How should we design our economy? We're going to have tariffs, trade, what are we going to do? How do that's a design question. Uh, how are we going to design our political system to, you know, make sure our, everything else works? And when you're talking about design a political system, you're into Plato's Republic. 
for those of you who had a little, a little stuff. So one way to express this is the US Constitution is an experimental design document. It's not a science document. Okay, it's a document about, it's an experiment. We're, we are the experiment. We have this experiment. Let's try to live together this way. This is how we, we're going to try and answer the question, how should we live? Which is a fundamental moral question. How should we live? And the U.S. Constitution is our, is our experimental, you know, exploration, okay? So it's a design document. So I see, so here's where I'm expanding. So we're all engineers, okay? And at and, and some point we're saying, how do I design my life? What's the, my design between work and family? These are all design questions. And the people who are clicking into this are now, instead of talking about engineering, a lot of them are just using the expression design thinking. Okay, so, but all this is coming together and I want to pull it all together. Um, all right, so where am I here? Uh, it's part three. So I have to go through this, and I'm going to do it fast because this is what my last lectures are about. But I kind of have to do it for where I want to end up in the part four. So part three is simply to say something, something's happening in the 20, 20th century. There has been a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift is from the scientific worldview to an engineering worldview. Now, the simplest way to put this is the scientific uh, uh, hypothesis, so to speak, is that all phenomena are governed by, all phenomena in the universe are governed by one universal order, one time, space, and variant order. Where does that come from? It's just another version for repeatability. So if I have scientific knowledge, then I, it's repeatable knowledge. So I, I can run Galileo's experiment, dropping the balls uh, from, from Pisa in 1575 or whatever it was. I can do the same experiment in Portland, Oregon in 2015. So it's time variance, location variance, space variance. So the laws, whatever the relationships, the regularities are of the universe, are time invariant and space invariant. Now, what happens with the scientific hypothesis is you expand that, extrapolate that. So the argument is, is the laws governing the universe at the instant of the Big Bang and the laws governing the universe at the end of time are the same laws, okay? And this is what Lee Smolin is starting to try and challenge, but because people are going like, well, there's problems with that. But anyway, that's fundamental to the scientific worldview and the scientific way of trying to understand the world, okay? So um, something happened at the, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. As we say, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, sci the scientific research program hit a wall, and the wall was uh, quantum theory. Um, and quantum theory basically is with, quantum, with, with complementarity in particular. In fact, here's my, this is your big word for tonight. Um, think of this complementary. So what, what they found was that the, there were two research programs. There was a Newtonian research program, which had to do with particles, physics, and things moving around, planets, projectiles, whatever, and it did really well. And then there was this other thing that came about called Maxwell's uh, uh, program, electromagnetism, and that was waves, and that was like, it was a completely different research, research program. And they came up with different phenomena and different enough. And as they started to figure out where they were together, and one of the kind of focal points is what is the electron? Is it a particle or a wave? And it turns out that it's, that it's, that it's undecidable. Uh, if you look at it one way, it's a particle. If you look at it another way, it's a wave. So well, what is it really? Like, well, it depends on how you look at it. Now, because these are not just particles and waves, these are two different orders of things going on in the universe, two different types of phenomena. So it's not that the, just that particles and waves are complementary, it's that the entire Newtonian physics and Maxwellian physics are complementary, okay? In fact, their space-time uh, frameworks are, are complementary. Uh, the, the Newtonian is a point in time, and the, and, the, uh, and the Maxwellian is a wave spread all over the place. Newtonian stuff is local, Maxwellian stuff is non-local. Non-local not only in space, but in time. <laughs> non-local in time is a tough concept, which I don't think uh, we've got a hold of yet. So anyway, we went through this thing. It started out, you know, Max Planck starts out this, you know, figuring out that uh, with the uh, problem of, uh, of uh, uh, understanding the light uh, spectra. Einstein comes along, sees the photoelectric effect, which is what he got the Nobel Prize for. And that the seeing that, that uh, light and then electricity as well come in packets, come in quanta and units. Okay, so you got this, you know, the continuous universe, but it also has this packet nature, has this particle nature and has wave nature. So what is it? So Bohr and Heisenberg um, argued for this idea of complementarity. And, uh, and basically what, is it, what was lost 
what was lost was the idea of objectivity, the idea that there was a way to answer these questions like, is the electron a particle or a wave? Are you a particle or a wave? Okay, well, everybody has a particle aspect and a wave aspect. Every wave has a particle aspect. So when you ask about anything, what is it? The answer is, well, it depends on how you look at it. All right, so it looks like we can't talk about reality out there anymore unless we specify how we're looking at it. So all of a sudden, the, the person is involved in this. And another thing I want to emphasize is, as it comes out, there, not, there are no waves and there are no particles, okay? And this is Louis de Broglie's, de Broglie's thing. These are interpenetrating concepts. So even though they're oppositely defined, one's local, one's non-local, one is at rest, one's moving, um, any, anytime you say, I'm going to look at a particle, there's always a wave aspect. Anytime you look at a wave, there's always a particle aspect, okay? So this is like, in, in objectivity, it used to be the law of excluded middles. Either it's a particle or it's a wave. And now we kind of reverse that. Get rid of those two extremes. Everything's in between. So every phenomena has a particle aspect, a wave aspect, depending on how much you focal, how you want to look at it. So the next big thing was that Heisenberg, and I, I attribute it to Heisenberg, maybe somebody else, but Heisenberg realized it's not just the particle and the wave that are, that are complementary. It's the experimental setups themselves. You've seen the two-slit experiment and so forth. So if you set up an experiment one way, you see the particle aspect. You set up another way, you see the wave aspect. So he says it's not just that the phenomena are complementary. Those experimental setups are complementary. So the structure of the experiment here and the structure of the experiment here are complementary. Another way to put it is the Maxwellian research program and the, part and the Newtonian research program are complementary courses of action. There are two different ways of investigating the world. There are two different ways of problem solving in certain ways, okay? This will become very important at the end, okay? Okay, a couple other things real quick about, about what happened in, uh, in this transition. One is that the... Uh, so when I decide which way to look at the world, I'm going to do this type of experiment or this type of experiment, I'm making a choice. And that's a bias. If it's a bias, it's somehow it's a value in some sense. I'm making a value choice. I'm going to look at the, I like the Newtonians better than I like the Maxwellians. So there's some sense in which there's a value choice in there. The other thing is, is when I make the choice, it's, it's not reversible. I mean, I make that choice, then I've gone into a universe in which I made that choice, and the universe goes in that direction. I make the choice this way, it goes in that direction. And these choices that I make and that everybody's making are cumulative over over time, okay? So the choices don't go away. It's not that I'm choosing this one, then I'll choose that one, then I'll choose this one, then I'll choose that one. Every time I make a choice, it's, it's there. It's historical, okay? So now that we put this, every time you run an experiment, you say, oh, I run this experiment 50 times. Well, and it's the same experiment. Well, it's not really the same experiment because there's a history, there's an irreducible historical element to that sequence, okay? You ran it once, then you ran it again, then you ran it, you gotta put it in your notebook, you write it down different times. You're maybe influenced later experiments by what happened in the early ones. So there's, a, there's an irreducible historical aspect to all this stuff going on, which, which is not there and doesn't make sense in terms of the uh, scientific model. So, uh, I got four points. Well, one thing I want to do here is this. So this is, this is Niels Bohr, and this is his coat of arms that he put together. Uh, he, because he became famous, he was, was something that ordered the elephant. Those little gold things around there are actually little mini elephants. The order of the elephant in Denmark, usually only uh, uh, princes and kings and their cousins and stuff get into this, but because he was so amazing and famous, he did. So he had to put together his own uh, coat of arms, and this is the coat of arms that he pulled up, okay? And the, the, the little motto over the top is this con, contraria, so basically contraries are complementary. There's a lot of deeper stuff about complementarity. It goes back to contraries and conjugate variables and stuff like that, which I'm not going to go into, but just, it's just this yin-yang thing is going to turn out to be somewhat important to our longer thing here. Okay. Um, okay, one thing I would say is, the takeaway from this is, one is that we, have, we move from a we call it a spectator model of inquiry in the science. So like there's an objective world out here and we're kind of like spectators on that. We're not interfering with the world. We're just trying to understand how it works. And that doesn't work anymore. So now we're actually participants. We're embedded and embodied in reality. And what we do as inquirers is part of reality. 
Okay, so whatever theory of reality you're going to come up with, it's got to have that learning in it too, that the system learns or people learn, okay? Um, and somebody, one guy, there's a Scientific American article I picked up one time. The guy said, it's really good that we didn't, you know, we didn't settle this question about waves and particles because we, the wave guys kept going and got some really new, interesting technologies. And the particle guys also got some really cool technologies. And so that was really cool. If we had decided that the electron was either particle or wave and shut down the other research program, that would have been a mistake. So both these programs are going on and they interact with each other. Your cell phone is part of the interaction of, of the particle and the wave uh, research programs. Okay. Okay. So the other thing is, because I'm making these choices, this thing is historical. But it's also the fact in in classical physics, is Newton's third law is the easiest way to get at it. Every action has an equal opposite reaction. Okay. So let's just figure that's true. What's the net change? Zero. Okay. Now this is built into the scientific worldview that action and reaction is all zero. So there's zero. John Barrow has a great, really great book called The Book of Nothing, and, which, and a couple other people have made the same point. And basically the idea is if you actually take modern physics, this is a classical physics, not quantum physics, and these, these, the presuppositions that define the scientific worldview, this scientific hypothesis, if you add everything up, all the, char all the charge in the universe is supposed to add up to zero, positive charge, negative charge, all the motions are supposed to add up to zero. So what do you got? You got zero. <laughs> I asked John, I said, there was a deal of Woody Allen was worried one time in a movie about the, ex the universe expanding. I asked John, I said, John, should I be worried <laughs> that the universe doesn't exist? You know, and he goes, I think you should worry about that. So this is, a, this is an implication. The other implication is that it doesn't change, okay? It doesn't, there is no net change in the universe, okay? So not as only as nothing, but it doesn't evolve, okay? These are implications of the classical scientific model of science, which goes back to repeatability. Sean Carroll wrote a brilliant book, too, called From Eternity to Here. She goes to the thermodynamics of this stuff, and he said, if, you're, if you just happen to be coming across a universe, let us say, uh, what is the most likely state of that universe? And the answer is equilibrium. So what Carroll is saying is that we really, from the point of view of science, this overwhelming, I mean, like 10 to the 100 and whatever, you know, likelihood that any universe you come across will be in equilibrium, okay? So what he's saying is we don't really have any scientific explanation for the Big Bang, okay? How is it we started, <laughs> how, where did this absolutely non-equilibrium point come from? I mean, there's just nothing in science that's going to be able to account for that, which is why Hoyle and all those guys, they actually, the whole expression, the Big Bang, was kind of a put-down, like, oh, yeah, the Big Bang, right. You know, like, you can't have that. And Hoyle and those guys went for a steady-state universe where, you know, th there was things created and, and going away. Anyway, okay, so that's just to point that out. Um, okay, uh, the last thing that we're going to do is the paradigm shift is also a problem shift. So we're going from the spectator... So what it is to be an inquirer or a problem solver was to kind of learn about the universe and come closer and closer to understanding it. The participant, and we get a participant universe, the problem is different. And the, it's, it's from, I, I'll express it this way, it's from how does the universe work, assuming it's mechanical, to how to work in the universe. Okay, and if I'm a problem solver, like Simon's saying, I want to go from a current state to a future more desirable state, so I want to know, I don't only, I want to know how to work in the world, but I also want to know how to make the world work better. Okay, so the participant is an engineer. You with me? All right. So there's something I call, that I like to call uh, Carnot's epiphany. And uh, this is Saadi Carnot, and he, he, his epiphany was that we're engineers in a world of engineering. Okay, the, the, the universe is not a clockwork. It's not a static clockwork. We're engineers in a world of engineering, and these engineering interactions are developmental. Okay? All right, so... Sorry, I'm going to time. Okay. So um, I'm going to go over uh, three things about... I, this is my talk, last two talks, about the engineering worldview and all this sort of stuff. I'm just going to go real quick because I have to hit a couple of points to get to where I want to go. Uh, okay, so one thing about the engineering worldview that I like, uh, Robert Reed, a colleague of mine at the University of Victoria, wrote this great book, which I think is almost self-explanatory. It says, biological emergences 
evolution by natural experiment. So what he's saying is the way in which life is evolving is by natural experiment. Okay, it's like, and, it, and it's seeking to find new relationships and stuff. It explores and experiments, okay? Like engineers do. This is what engineering is about, okay? Exploring. That's how engineers learn. They explore. They try things out, okay? So that's different. I just want to contrast. It's very different from the, from the you know, neo-Darwinian thing where, you know, there's sort of like these, uh, you know, random... Uh, um, Whatever it is, I mean, if if I'm inventing something, on the one hand, inventions are not predictable, but they're not random either. But from the neo-Darwinian point of view, they just have random. Now, the other problem that they have is uh, so the Darwinian thing is non-cumulative. Okay, so Reed's process is learning and learning and learning. It's called recursively enabling. Do you know the word recursive? It just means if I do something, I produce something, then I come back and I operate on that, and that produces something else, and I operate on that, that's recursion. Okay, I keep going back, you know, I create something, then I build on what I created, and then I build something more, and then I build on what I created, and I build something more. Okay, that's recursion. So what, what Reed's saying is, is that this is actually a learning process. Okay, it's a developmental process and enabling. So evolution is this... Uh, expanding, uh, enabling, developing process, okay? Now, it doesn't work for the Darwinian thing, because what they got, if, the con if, if, you know, it's like natural selection, you know, natural selection of the weak, you know, like, uh, like soup of the day or something like that. So natural selection may be selecting for one thing in this era, select selecting for something else in another area, in another era, okay? And as Steve, Stephen Gould points out, there's no, there's no overall selecting for there. You know, there's nothing that you can point to that it's selecting for, okay? It's like, depends on the conditions. But in this thing, it's cumulative and it's learning process and developing, okay? So what's happened for the Neo-Darwinians, because they don't have any ultimate parameter, you know, ultimate natural selection, they, they have defaulted, embarrassingly, to the idea that evolution is just change, merely change, okay? Now, I think that's pretty much, uh, the evidence is totally against that. Uh, it, it looks more to me like uh, Reed, Reed is correct. Okay, second person is, uh, second one here is uh, Dorian Sagan, Eric Snyder. I've mentioned these. They wrote a book called Into the Cool. Basically, they take an engineering model. They're uh, either ecologists, Snyder's ecologists in particular. Uh, the Earth is a biosphere, is an ecosystem, and that ecosystem has developed. And they say, how has that developed? And they say it's developed in analogy to the development of a steam engine the early steam engine, later steam engine. Okay. It's got better, the organizational structures of it is better. It's got more, efficient, and more efficient and more effective. And effectively, they say that the, the parameter for them is that the engine earth is able to perform more work, okay, work in the engineering sense. It's able to do more things. So from the early organisms up to now, the, the parameter of evolution, it is developmental, and what it's doing is getting ability to do more things, more freedom. Is one thing, more opportunity, okay? All right, so, third one. George Brugliarello, uh, master engineer. Brugliarello says, he was in the lecture series here too, and George wanted to emphasize that engineers should be taught that their work is a natural extension of biological evolution. What that means, of course, is that biological evolution is an engineering process. Okay, so, what's wrong with that? Okay, so let me get a contrast. So, I, I don't like pick on diabetics, but whatever. So type is easy. So sorry. So we invented insulin now. So people that had type one diabetes, you say they used to die at 12, 14, 16 years old. They're lucky if they ever reproduced. We got insulin in now. Now they live nice, normal lives. Okay, and and they're able to reproduce. And they okay. So arguably, now we have all that type one diabetes uh, gene going through the gene pool. We've weakened the gene pool. So that. Technological advance led to a weakening of the, of the population. Now, the point is, this is actually a general point. So think back to agriculture. Think of all the agricultural technology. Without that agricultural technology, a lot of people just wouldn't be here. You know, you'd be out hunter-gatherers. Okay, we got the plow, we got, you know, domesticated animals, we did all that. Think of all the technologies, the whole history of Western civilization, all these technologies have expanded. They have not been selecting the, the fastest, you know, hottest, most whatever, okay, as the Darwinians do. In fact, this is a cumulative thing, and the process is the, the weaker get to come along with us, okay? 
And it's not that it's just, I used to say it's survival of the weakest, but it's not just that because the stronger are getting stronger, but we're bringing the weak along with us. I mean, I like good image of Stephen Hawking and whatever. But, but the, the trend of evolution that Bugliero is putting out, is a lot of people said, well, you know, engineers are, engineers are countering natural selection. They're fighting natural selection. Somebody said, as soon as we became tool makers, you know, normal evolution ended. Well, I think it goes all the way back. And that's another argument. But anyway, so that just pointed out that this engineering view of evolution is very different from the Darwinian scientific branch. Um, okay. So, last one here. Next to the last one. <clears throat> Paul Romer, who I've talked about. Romer made a move. So in economics, scientific economics is an equilibrium. Economics, supply, demand, supply, demand. And Romer noted, everybody noted, that, that all of a sudden it was going up like this. Well, wait a minute, it's equilibrium here, but why is it going up? Okay, so the economies were getting better and better at doing something, okay, since the Industrial Revolution, you know, why is the economy going up? It used to be that the only reason an economy would go up or down was it would fluctuate a little bit, but it was always trying to be in equilibrium. It was always, you know, like action-reaction stuff. And Romer made this, in 1990, wrote this famous article now, uh, called endogenous technological change. What Romer did this is my hand way of looking at this. Instead of equilibrium, Romer went like this. No, he said, what, ec what economies are doing is problem solving. Okay, they're trying to move from a current state of affairs to a better state of affairs, economically, socially, all this. You know, they're engines. They're engines. They're trying to develop. They're trying to create wealth. They're trying to make the world better. They're trying to make the population happier, wealthier, more wonderful. Okay? So, Economics is no longer a scientific discipline, it's an engineering discipline. And, and, and economics and whole of Western civilization is an engineering enterprise. Okay. Now, one, I, just, one, I like this one thing about Romer. So, Romer gives this example uh, of what's going on. He says, uh, you know, he says, 10 years ago, I used to, I used to, I had to pay $100 to put a gigabyte of RAM in my computer. And he says, and he said now I can get that same, you know, gigabyte of RAM for 10 bucks. And then he says, and I didn't do anything. Now here's the kicker. What he's saying here is that as a society, as a system, different people <laughs> solve problems that benefit other people. So all of a sudden I'm going like, wait a minute, do I want to compete with you? Do I want to take all the resources and have them to myself? No, I want to give you all the possible resources I can give you. I mean, we want to put them out in some rational manner, but... Uh, good ideas come from all sorts of crazy places, and they benefit, and they have an accelerating effect. I mean, computers moving through the economy, it's just huge accelerating effect on, on doing business in new, better, more efficient ways, okay? So the message is, it's in my interest that, others, that other people succeed, and, and vice versa. Okay, this is, a, this is a, what I call one of, one of uh, uh, Richard Dawkins' revelations in extended phenotype, too. So he's like, oh, it's interesting. It's, it's interesting. I know I'm totally selfish. I want the rest of the, I want the rest of the environment to be doing well too. You know, like so he kind of doesn't get the whole way, but he kind of gets his revelation. Okay, and last thing, just if if you buy into the engineering worldview, it's not just, you know, biological evolution. It's not just economics. It's not. Or, uh, you got to go the whole way. And uh, this is what happened uh, early in the uh, discussion of what happens with a quantum universe and so forth. John Archibald Wheeler, who was supposed to be the guy who was going to wear the mantle of Einstein after Einstein died, he said, I don't want to do it. But he was like Kip Thorne's uh, teacher and uh, Richard Feynman's teacher. And he came up with something called the participatory anthropic principle. And basically what he's saying is you wouldn't have a universe if you didn't have people, if you didn't have participants. There is no universe without participants making choices. Okay, it doesn't get off the ground. All right, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Okay, so we're into part four. So now we're into, I want to come back now to this question of the relationship of engineering and humanities, which I hope you're getting that kind of general idea of. Um, so the guy, I'm going to start off with this guy real quick, a guy named Immanuel Kant. Any of you take a serious ethics course in... Uh, or serious philosophy course in college. You've heard of this guy. He's a German philosopher. Didn't get a lot of things right, but he had a lot of things he did right. Uh, wrote something called Critique of Pure Reason, and actually I wanted it to be the Critique of Practical Reason. Second thing he wrote, he had three critiques. Critique of Pure Reason, Critique of Practical Reason, and the Critique of Judgment, okay? And it's the second critique that's important, the Critique of Practical Reason. Because your critique of practical reason is another way to say it, it's a critique of engineering practice and method. Okay? It's a, it's a critique of 
of the design enterprise. And what he says in that, I mean, there's one message that comes out of that. And he said, you know, when you're, when you're pra doing practical problem solving, you're making value choices. You know, I'm going to do this and, you know, because that's going to bring about, you know, a better world in this way or that way. You're making choices about that. And you're making choices about how you want to live or how you'll live. You're also making choices about how we're going to live. Okay? And, and so what he says is that the question, how should we live, is the defining question of morality. Okay, this was Socrates too. So it's the most important question. He says, how should we live? So how should we live, being asked by a participant in the world, is the fundamental question. So what engineering is, is actually a moral enterprise. It's actually trying to figure out how we should live. How can we live better? How can we make the world work better, okay? So this is why in your article and your thing, why should engineers become philosophers? There it is. Okay, so another way to put the problem now is that the, so great, the engineering and morality. So the problem is that one of the assumptions of engineering is that we have free will. There are alternative futures. I can wave my hand this way or I can wave it that way. I have choices and there's opportunities. And that's the good news. The bad news is, is <laughs> I like the way the existential Continental philosophers, existential philosophers put it, they're like, oh great, we have the ability to act in the world, but there's no script. I mean, what, what is it we're supposed to be doing? You know? And, and they, they, they had a lot of existential, a lot of angst, you know, like, oh, what am I going to do? What am I supposed to do? You know, I don't believe the church, you know, but if I don't believe them, I'm, what am I supposed to do? Here I am, free, I can do this. What am I supposed to do? And they had a lot of angst about that, a lot of fear and you know, who am I really? You know, I mean, when I thought about that, I go like, God, that's cool. I don't, you know, there's nobody telling me what to do. I can do whatever I want. I was like, I got excited about all the creative opportunity in front of me. I go like, hey, I'm this autonomous agent. I can do whatever I want. I can do this wonderful stuff. And obviously, I have some constraints and stuff, but uh, anyway, so the question is, how, how should we organize ourselves? Given that we have this freedom, what should we do? So there's a lot of debate about, there's this... Uh, middle of the 20th century, a lot of debate about, well, progress, what should be our progress policy? And it was just a mess. Everybody had different ideas. So the default was uh, sustainability. Okay, we can all agree that one thing we don't want to do, we may not know how we want to go forward, but we know we don't want to go backwards. Okay, so let's not do anything that undermines our ability to, you know, be here and consider other options. Now, so Kant takes another step. Excuse me, and this is and it's called the uh, it's called the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. If you ever took a college ethics course, you hopefully got exposed to this. And roughly speaking, Kant sort of asked the question. He's like, "Well, I can't say anything that we should do. What can we do? What can we say about our general a general principle of how we should act in the world?" He said, "Well, first of all, uh, he's looking for a general design principle, if you like. How should we design our lives? How should we design our thing?" And he said, "Well." The first thing is, is, in terms of the specifics, it's going to depend on the people and the circumstances and the age. And, you know, I, I can't tell you what to do on specific things. But he says, maybe there's something that we can say. And he calls it some, some general principle that's going to be applicable to all situations. Okay? And he calls it the categorical imperative. And a categorical imperative is usually a lot of people say, well, this is a Kant's version of the, of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That can be a general principle. It doesn't tell you what to do exactly in this situation or that situation, but it says, you know, when you're making your decision, you know, do unto others as you have them do unto you. So Kant reasons in this. He said, well, look, there's certain things like stealing and lying and cheating and so forth that, that if we do those, if we start doing those, and the easiest way to say this, what goes around comes around. So if you start doing those, if those become actions in the world, then they're going to be things that are, that, that, you know, undermine the sustainability of the system. They, you know, people aren't going to trust each other and, you know, the, the possibility of doing good things in the world is going to be, going to be undermined. So the opportunity space is going to shrink. So, and generally just say, you know, don't be selfish is one way to put it. I mean, don't try to, don't try to gain by diminishing others. That's one 
do unto others, you're going to do unto you. And what this is, for, for Kant, this is like a principle of moral sustainability, okay? They're saying, if, you don't, if we don't do that, then the system's going to, you know, everybody's going to start cheating each other, and it's who can cheat the other person in the best way and lie and defraud them and so forth. Okay, we only, somebody will say, you only cooperate with somebody f until you get a chance to stab them in the back later, you know, like. So, I would call the, I'm going to call this a negative, Kant's negative heuristic. Heuristic's a big word for methods and how you're going to do things, okay? So, but what's a positive heuristic? So, a negative heuristic, fine, you're not, you don't, don't cheat, steal, lie, don't screw people, whatever. So, what's, so, but what we need, we still don't know what to do, okay? So what is, so I'm telling my engineer and all the whole range of engineering, well, how are we going to act? Well, don't screw people. All right, well, then what do I do? And a lot of people said, well, that's a nice form, but there's no content to it. It doesn't tell me, you know, it doesn't get me anywhere on a day-to-day -day basis. So one thing, one thing that's good about the, the Dawkins, you know, selfish gene stuff was it brought up this really nice debate in evolutionary theory between, well, should you be selfish or, you know, well, everything, he said, everything's selfish. It's all selfish and you're irrational if you're, being, you know, altruistic and selfless. And, and it's important to understand Dawkins' formal definitions of what it means to be selfish and selfish. So to be selfish, you need to gain for yourself, but you also, you, in order to gain, you also have to diminish somebody else. Okay, that's the only way you can gain. And if you're going to be selfless, you have to let somebody else gain and diminish yourself. Okay? But you can't just, you know, they're, they're tied. And the reason they're tied together is this zero-sum game stuff. Okay? Action, reaction, symmetry, no change. Okay, so there's no real change in, in what's in the world, and the only way to get ahead in the world, according to Dawkins, is to diminish others. Okay? Now, there's been a lot of debate about this, obviously. Uh, a lot of people have bought into Dawkins. I saw somebody say, oh, this kid came uh, driving over to see the, this uh, Dawkins lecture, and he said the kid, because he read your book, The Selfish Gene, he gave up his religion. And Dawkins, Dawkins responds, he goes like, yeah, I think maybe he sort of overemphasized that a little bit. So anyway, so this is direct conflict with what Kant's saying, okay? Kant's saying, no, trying to be selfish, that's a bad move. And the main thing is this, that I want to get across is this zero-sum game stuff. Okay, and, and of course, Romer's saying, okay. We're getting there, we're getting there. Okay, so here's where complementary int Enters, re enters. Okay, we complementary in physics. So, what I want to say, and remember I've said that like the Newtonian program was a, you know, a, a way of solving problems, okay, and a Maxwellian way of solving problems, and maybe they work together a little bit. So, what I want to say is that there's a very general, complementary is very general. And complementary is about, there are complementary design agendas, okay? For instance, individualism. Socialism, Republicans, Democrats, okay? These are different design agendas, okay? They think, like, this is the way you should go. This is the way you should go, okay? And the existence of these is extremely important for our engineering practice and thinking about what you're doing as an engineer at any of these levels. And if they are complementary, here's the real problem. If they are complementary, they're not resolvable, okay? So each one has a different language, the language of waves, the language of particles, the language of free enterprise, the language of socialism, and they just talk past each other. Okay? Ever, you've seen any of this in the political debate? Yes. Okay. And uh, so that goes on a lot. So, but if they're not resolved, so a guy who was influential on me, the guy named uh, Michael Oakeshott, it's a guy in London who's a political scientist. And, and Oakeshott makes this statement. He said, no working society, or he said, every working society has a cooperative aspect and a competitive aspect. Okay, if you actually try and think through, could you have a purely competitive, purely, so you can't, okay? They all, all real working societies have both those complementary aspects. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so many example, this is my example, some people don't like this. So, say you go to a soccer match. In the soccer match, you're, you're, you're watching the soccer match. I'm going to ask you a question. What are you observing? Are you observing competitive behavior or cooperative behavior? Okay. Both. More than that, they're actually interdependent. And, and uh, I mean, you've got to have rules. Where's the goal? What's outside? What's a foul? You know, and those rules, in some sense, allow the competitors to, be, to do their best thing. Okay. 
Now, the other thing is, if you just, if you just go totally competitive, one thing that happens, this is old Socratic argument, he says, well, competition, that's great. I'm glad the universe is all competitive. Competitions are winners and losers, right? Oh, yeah, right. So over a period of time, <laughs> each time you have another, sooner or later, one person is going to be the winner of everything, is going to own everything, okay? In the economic competition, at which point there's no longer any competition. So the point is, if you iterate one of these ideologies, it tends to undermine itself, lead to its... All right, okay. So, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this. Um, so the, I'm going to go back to Bohr's. I'm going to go this way, okay. So, the, ta the, the, the Taoist path, so I'm going to, here's, the, the Tao is this, you know, uh, Chinese ancient thing about how you used to live and everything. And, and the Tao is often translated as the path. So this is the, plan, this is the path forward, okay. This is the path of life, how you should live, sort of thing. And the problem is, and, and, and the Tao number one, the first entry is uh, the Tao that can be spoken is not the real Tao. Okay, so I translate this a little bit. The Tao that can be pre-specified, preconceived, written down, is not the real one. Okay. Another way to say it is, it's, it's, so so for instance, I'm trying to be on this path. So if I listen to uh, one group, I say, whenever in doubt, which is always. Whenever in doubt, always turn to the left. Another group says, hmm, whenever in doubt, always turn to the right, okay? Now the problem is, is if you iterate those things, just so they come to, they tend to spin in on themselves, okay? And self-destruct. So either the ideologies taken to the extreme will self-destroy itself. So the path forward is somehow, you know, a creative working together of these, these things, okay? Um, now, I have another image. It's called the island. Say I have a bunch of Republicans, I put them on an island. Per hypothesis, they will soon split into Republicans and Democrats. A bunch of Democrats put them on an island. They'll soon separate into Republicans and Democrats. Because that's, each of these approaches to problem solving are interdependent and interlinked, cooperative and, and competitive, for instance. So if they, one of these groups gets the upper hand, like the Democrats get the upper hand and they destroy all the Republicans, ah, now everybody can think rationally, all right? Well, they'll go under or they'll split up again. All right, such is the, the image I'm trying to give you of these, com these uh, complementary things. Um, okay, well, so I'm gonna go on without that. So one other image here, I, I was in Hawaii one time, I went and secluded myself to uh, figure out the world. And, uh, and I was thinking about this stuff, and I was thinking about, I started thinking about tough love. You remember the tough love thing? So the tough love thing is sort of like, it's between Spock and Dobson. Okay, Spock is like, whatever your kid does, love them, you know, embrace them. Dobson, you know, when a kid does something wrong, you whack them, you know, or something. And, uh, and everybody, a lot of people said, well, you know, it's, it's the middle way, isn't it? I mean, you want a little bit of discipline, but you also want a little bit of sympathy and trying to figure that out. So this evolved into an image in my mind about this competition, how the competition and cooperation work together. And it was this, it was sort of like, sort of like a pendulum, okay? At any given moment in time, you know, individualism is gaining and there's lots of good things happening. Oh, more individualism, that's great. But as the pendulum goes up, it's sort of start, it's, it's, we're iterating it, but it's, the positive returns are like declining, okay? And the people down here are going like, yeah, I don't think I'm buying into that anymore. The young ones go like, I am buying into those old guys telling me to keep, you know, more freedom, more individualism. So, and then it starts going the other way. Okay, and then it goes back and it swings back and forth. Now, ideally, these are working together. But the idea is that, the idea is this, is that the advances in individualism plow the field for the seeds of cooperation. And the advances in cooperation sow the seeds for more individualism. Okay, that's my image of how these yin-yangs work together. All right, I'm almost done. So the last thing here is in the in Dawkins' zero-sum game, uh, you have win-lose and lose-win. Okay, and what's crucial to this model that I'm suggesting to you is that there are win-win relationships, and that's a, that's a challenge. Okay, are there win-win relationships? Well, one thing I say, if there weren't Win-win relationships means that the universe goes somewhere. So actually it isn't, doesn't add up to zero and it doesn't just stay there. Win-win relationships are how the universe is built. Okay, the formation is win-win relationships. My, 
My uh, favorite uh, business philosopher, uh, uh, Stephen Covey, has a lot of this, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He talks about this. He says, when you're forming a business relationship, he said, maybe it looks like it's win-lose, like you're going to gain more than there, or they're, you're going to gain, they're going to lose, or maybe you're going to lose and they're going to win. He said, that's the deal. He said, win-lose, lose-win, no deal. He said, unless it's win-win, unless the relationship that we form benefits both of us, then don't do it. Okay, so what we're looking for, so here's the, my design, my general design principle. is like, you want to know how to look for a good design, look win-win. Okay, in business, and just about, in agriculture, anything you talk about, look for the win-win relationship. So any relationship you're talking about, or anything you're designing, should be win-win, or win-win-win-win, if you've got multiple things. Now the problem, of course, in this dial is this dialogue. How are we going to talk about this? Because... They're two different languages, they, you know, this talking past each other stuff, okay? So we have a system, that w very simply, something I call the parliamentary attitude. The parliamentary attitude is, is the idea of a loyal opposition. opposition. <laughs> what I'm going to say is that, so when you're talking to someone, so if you're a, you know, kind of on the political right and you're listening to someone on the political left, you know, like, not only do you disagree with them, it appears to you that they're not making sense, Okay? They don't understand, you know, I mean, it's, it's literally, it's like, no, they're irrational. You know, it, doesn't, it doesn't, whatever it is they're saying doesn't translate into your way of thinking and vice versa. You ever had that idea? If I were you, I wouldn't do that. Let's say, like, these are different ways of looking at the world, and they're incommensurable. That's the big word, incommensurable. So if we have this situation where we have incommensurable design agendas going on, how do, they, how do we work together? The bad news is we try and wipe each other out and establish one way, all black, all white, whatever. The parliamentary attitude is the idea that we have a dialogue. And one of, one of Covey's uh, ideas of the dialogue I think is quite good. It's really kind of funny. He goes, he gets these people, he'll bring them up on stage, like an abortion thing, and you know, pro-abortion, pro-life, pro or pro-choice. And he gets them up there and he's there, you know, taking shots at each other as they're walking onto the stage. And they sit down and he says, well, here's the deal. Okay, now you shut up. Do you tell, tell this person over here what your position is? Okay, so here's, a, here's what I think. Now, this person has to tell that person back to them what their position is until they agree. Yeah, you got it. Then they reverse it. Then this guy says, here's what my position is. And he said, in a very short period of time, they're talking the middle ground. They're talking about creative ways to work together. Because a lot of it is like, well, you want to do, you know, they polarized very quickly. John Haidt has a really great book called The Righteous Tribes or something like that, Righteous something, uh, where he talks about how we get in these tribes and then we start throwing bricks at each other. And the truth is, is that we all kind of are in the middle. Okay, I'm just about done here. So anyway, Covey, so Covey's thing, and it's, I talk to some people who are in counseling, they say, oh, that's why you do marriage counseling. Tell me what you said. You shut up. Tell me what you think is going on. You say it back to them, go ahead back. So this is listening. One of Covey's things is listen first and then talk, okay? So the way to find, and these are creative compromises. One of the ideas of compromise that goes out is zero-sum game. If you're talking about compromise, if I have the upper hand but you're blocking me, I have to give up a little to get back to, okay? So it's still zero-sum. Why would I compromise? Why would I give up something? Why would I let you be better? Why would I give you more of whatever number, amount of goods is on the table? Why do I split it with you? Okay, so the idea of a creative compromise, which is what this is all about, the creative compromise is we sit down and we start talking and you go like, you know, I see what your bottom line is and you see what my bottom line is. If we work together, we can do something. We can do things that neither one of us could have done by ourselves. Okay, it's called synergy. Okay. So things come about, both of us benefit, and there's something new coming about because we figured out how to work together. All right, so that's the big positive heuristic. I'm going to just close out here real quick. There's a, the, I don't know if you guys read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And, and, and Robert Persick talks about, it's a lot about value or about quality. And he talks about, he gives his uh, students, and he's trying to get him, he's a literature professor, he's getting him to talk, give him some essays talking about quality. 
And they go like, how do I know what quality is? What is quality? I don't know. And he says, you know. And he says, well, I don't know. I'm trying, what do you mean? Guy, how do I know? I don't know. So he gives them a series of essays. He gives them some essays to read. And he said, rank them. Okay, and well, he's given them some really, you know. And they all rank them the same. This is brilliant. This is crap. How'd you know? Okay, you know. And part of the idea here is that we are all the result of evolution. And we know a lot. And it's like you call it your conscience, your intuition, your whatever. So you know a lot about what's good and what isn't good. But we still need, in order to move forward in progress, we need to have this, this yin-yang thing. So part of it is, I'm going to give this talk in China in July, shorter version. I only get 15 minutes. So they, but basically the idea is this, is that it, it's this working together that is a positive, that is how you make progress. And it's not easy because these are incommensurable. They don't have exactly the same language. Although, the thing, there's a thing called aporia. It's a big word that the Greeks use. And aporia is a the Greek translation is puzzlement. And Socrates would always start somebody and they say, oh, gee, I heard, heard uh, Glenn that uh, you have the answer to the way the world works. And he goes, yeah, it's all, everything is competition. He goes like, God, I'm so happy to hear that. You know, I've been thinking about this for a long time and I, finally you've got the answer. He says, but you know, this is such an important question. Do you, do you, do you don't mind if I ask you a few questions about it? Yeah. <laughs> guys, of course, of course. So he starts, you know, soccer game. So he starts talking about the competition, and it turns out that the guy actually doesn't just believe in competition. He believes in cooperation in the world as well. And th at this point, this is the point of aporia, when the person realizes, he thinks I'm a free enterprise ideologue, and then he realizes, well, of course, you've got to have some rules, and you've got to have some agreements. and all that. So all of a sudden you realize, and the argument is this, is you th we don't really have beliefs, is the argument, okay? You think you believe this or you believe that. What's circumstantial, okay? You believe, you have a range. You, we're all middle ground. We're all like this. We all can understand the value of competition. We can all understand the value of cooperation if we listen and if we think about it, okay? So the message for the general design, the positive heuristic, positive heuristic for the design agenda is to be able to uh, co uh, communicate and look for these creative win-win relationships. And that's how the world works. That's how evolution has occurred. And that's how we'll go on. I'll leave it at that. Thank you.